Hi everyone, welcome to Speak in Territory, a podcast by School of International Relations and Strategic Studies, University of Mumbai. Today we have a special guest with us, Dr. Chitanya Giri. He is a consultant of space policy and space diplomacy at the Research and Information System for Developing Countries, New Delhi. He was earlier the Fellow for Space and Ocean Studies at Gateway, of, Gateway House of Mumbai. He has been a visiting scientist at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, US. And he has a doctorate in chemistry with a specialization in uh, analytical astrochemistry. He has, he has consulted the National Security Council Secretariat at the Prime Minister's office and was a nominated member of the International Cooperation Review of the Ministry of Science and Technology and Ministry of Earth Sciences, Government of India. He speaks regularly on public forums and teaches at various domestic and international institutions. Also, he is the author of the book called India in the Second Age of Interplanetary Connectivity. Thank you, sir, for joining us today on our podcast and uh, we are looking forward for an interesting conversation. Same here. Same here. So, uh, my first question to you will be that uh, space already plays a role in advancing global sustainability and security priorities, but the potential is even greater. And how will the emergence of space exploration act as uh, space economy in the decade of 2020s? Okay, that's a brilliant question. It has many tiers to it. So let me address them one by one. You mentioned about space economy and where do we stand in the global space economy. So numbers suggest, so numbers created by good consulting firms around the world, they suggest that the global space economy is roughly around uh, $475 billion right now uh, and of which the space business that comes out of India is roughly around 2%. Now we want to increase that stake and the reason being that uh, the space economy in the coming years is uh, going to grow from uh, currently 475 billion to around 3.3 trillion dollars by 2040. So this is a manifold increase and in this manifold increase what uh, India would want to do is have a as big share as possible and things are conducive for us, our economy is uh, in a great shape for now and the projections given by all multilateral institutions and uh, international banks uh, have shown that India's, basic, uh, or India's economy is going to grow uh, many fold in the coming years. So we will certainly address or attend and get the 10 trillion dollar target which we are aiming at right now. And then we also set up a few targets uh, which are in the niches. One target is uh, that we want to also create a digital economy of around a trillion dollars by the year 2028. And there can't be a trillion dollar digital economy with contributions from space economy. Because as you find that uh, many of the digital assets uh, are intimately connected with outer space, especially satellites. And if you look at companies in and around us in India, so more recently in 2020, Airtel, which we all know is the biggest, uh, one of the biggest uh, telecom service providers, uh, it has acquired a British satellite telecom company called as OneWeb. And more recently, OneWeb uh, has dispatched around 25 satellites to India, which uh, will be launched by India's PSLV rocket uh, very soon. Uh, likewise, Geo is also entering into the satcom territory, satellite uh, telecommunication territory. So Geo's 6G network or Airtel's 6G network will be beamed from outer space. And imagine the money churned uh, through these assets that these big companies are creating. So digital economy and space economy are intimately linked. You spoke about sustainability, yes, remote sensing satellites which are not beaming telecommunication signals but picking up imagery of our earth, uh, they are being used for n number of applications. So the simplest application we are setting here very close to Bandra Kurla complex which is a hub of finance. In the coming years, uh, 
the banking uh, sector, the insurance sector, and the non-banking financial firms, they will be using satellites to pick up images of those assets that they that are under their collateral or assets that uh, are you know surveyed by them. So if they have to pay any compensation, insurance compensation, let's say to a farmer, the insurance firm will check whether the farmer has indeed uh, faced any losses and based on those losses using technology like AI, uh, estimates will be uh, made and based on those estimates the compensations will be disbursed to the farmer. Same is the case with uh, what we have here in Maharashtra, we call it as Sakbara. There is this form which is usually used to uh, earmark uh, uh, agricultural property. Uh, so many a times uh, there are you know, quarrels and disputes, legal disputes when it comes to demarcation of properties. Ki yahan se yahan tak mera hai, wahan se wahan tera hai and all that. And people usually fight over the demarcations. Now to get rid of this sort of fights which tend to clog our legal machinery a lot, uh, again space based data will be used where coordinates will be chopped for all the properties that you own and coordinates don't change ever. At least on a time scale of a few hundred years they don't change. So based on those coordinates you will be uh, property will be earmarked and there won't be any legal hassles beyond that. So, uh, the, so these are the commercial applications. There are some again natural applications. You have torrential rains happening in the Indian subcontinent because of climate change. Uh, there, there are enormous amounts of damages uh, to urban property, rural property. Uh, you want to map those damages, you want to mitigate those damages. Uh, then you want to map the forest land. Uh, here in India, luckily for us, our forest cover is growing uh, quite healthily. Uh, and uh, to map the forest cover, you need again satellite images. And why are forest cover uh, becoming important? Because in the coming years, countries with a healthy forest cover are going to get uh, great dividends or great benefits from international financial mechanisms. So if, if your country is doing well on decarbonization, if your country is doing well on uh, in terms of uh, attaining your net zero emission targets, then your country is going to get good finances from the international mechanisms, especially pension funds and whatnot. So in all these satellite images will come to use and again in terms of the sustainable development goals, sustainable development goals uh, can't be achieved without support of space based uh, assets. So this is all happening, we are in the thick of it and uh, with the private sector reforms that have happened in India, uh, things are going to move really fast here after. So like since we uh, spoke about space economy, so do you think that space sector could have a major role in India uh, becoming a developed com country by 2047? Oh yes, oh yes. There can't be a developed economy on this planet without space-based assets. So if you look at uh, modern history, the victors of the Second World War uh, and even the losers, the Axis forces, none of them have shunned space technologies. So everybody got onto it, latched on their strategic interest with uh, space technologies right from the very beginning. And uh, same is the case with India. Uh, until now, we were under this myopic mindset that space assets need to be controlled, operated, administered by the government and all the data that can be grasped out of these satellites needs to be entirely in the custody of the government. But uh, with the current uh, dispensation in New Delhi, it is pretty clear and they've made it pretty clear that the government has no business to be in business. And that's why what they've done is they have gotten away from a lot of uh, business opportunities that the government has been clinging on and 
the government wants the private sector to pick up these opportunities now one by one so i so when i just told you that there are opportunities for the financial world the insurance sector the banking sector the agriculture sector the urban management the rural management the land cover okay all those uh, uh, farmers farmers would want access to satellite data so that they can uh, they can sow the seeds of the best crops that could grow in that season so if that season is conducive for let's say a crop the farmers won't choose the b crop that they have been planting all this while they'll choose the a crop because the estimates the scientifically generated estimates are suggesting him or her to pick up that particular seed or that particular crop so what uh, what will that do that will only enhance the agricultural productivity okay uh, with meteorological satellites if a certain season is a bit dry if, if a certain season is a bit wet so like for instance this kharif season uh, the coming kharif season after diwali is a bit wet because we have had torrential rains in and across india and in certain regions of india rains have passed even 100% so these sort of estimates or studied estimates are very much necessary for preventing a lot of damages and losses that are happening and once you start preventing damages and losses um, things get easy for you uh, i'll give you a very simple analogy in cricket people say that catches win matches so if you catch the ball at the right place at the right time at the right over you the chances of you winning a match are higher same is the case if you are going to prevent certain losses definitely that's going to um, strengthen the economy and that's where uh, space economy is going to help india in the longer run directly as well as indirectly thank you sir so my next question for you will be that we're living in a golden age of sample return missions and the year 2020 proved to be a big success with nasa's oris's rex mission how do you think india should capitalize on this opportunity so osiris rex uh, was or is a uh, asteroid sample return mission and uh, if you look at the history of space exploration in the past 50 60 years you would find that our first target was the moon we eventually went on to uh go and visit the nearby comet uh, nearby planets so venus was one of the earliest uh, targets for our space exploration studies mars uh, again around the same time and eventually by the 1980s we started venturing out into the outer solar system beyond the asteroid belt where we started visiting uh, uh, jupiter neptune uranus saturn and all those with osiris rex uh, and hayabusa which is simultaneously going to an asteroid and picking up samples and bringing them back what makes them interesting is because uh, here on earth we are right now sort of uh, struggling to meet ends with a certain kind of minerals which are very much necessary so your mobile phone this camera this uh, microphone they all need a certain kind of metals which are called as rare earth elements rare earth metals and these are not readily available here on earth there are certain countries like china who have vast reserves and they control the supply chain the global supply chain so much so that uh, it puts a tremendous amount of uh, uh, pressure on other countries uh, with its stranglehold over the reserves so what countries uh, who do not have such kind of reserves within their territory what they are wanting to do is they were wanting to explore such minerals elsewhere and the easiest targets celestial targets are asteroids and that's why uh, americans with their osiris rex are wanting to pick back, bring back samples from the asteroid to check whether they have it in there same is the case with the japanese the japanese have visited a asteroid two asteroids twice uh, so one asteroid was itokawa the other asteroid was they named it they have the liberty to name wherever they are going and many of the celestial objects around are unnamed so they named one as itokawa and the other one is named as ryugu so they recently brought back samples from these two asteroids 
and they are checking right now whether they contain the necessary uh, commercially viable concentration of minerals and if it is commercially viable if it is found that way then you will have private sector companies who would want to go there pick up uh, feasible volume and mass of metals bring them back and use it for a variety of applications so that is coming right now so that's where the future is going and uh, we are sort of uh, wanting to preserve whatever is present on earth not fight over it and rather start exploring the the massive massive resources that are available for us in the solar system so since we talked about like china china having resources so china's space program is quite ahead of india's and like what do you think in like in what ways can india catch up to the space race between both nations so firstly they are ahead of us secondly we are not in a race with them uh, because we are going at our own pace uh, we are doing things uh, easily if not we are not rushing into things so and if and i'll give an example so china has been to uh, has sent astronauts in 2003 if we would have been in a race we would have sent astronauts immediately even by pinching our tummies uh, so we haven't done that same is the case with the chinese uh, lunar exploration china has been to the moon in the past 12 years almost five times we have been to the moon only twice and they have gone to the moon at regular intervals and at different sites we haven't shown that sort of exigency while going to the moon then uh, china has a very uh, dark uh, budget for space based activities uh, and we don't know how much are they investing and since it's a nearly 20 trillion dollar economy they have vast pools of uh, monetary resources available for them to pump in whereas in our case we have to showcase our entire space budget every month of february or every month of march whenever our finance minister showcases that okay this much amount of money has gone into the outer space program okay so we have we are very careful with that our public funding is quite out there it's in the open for scrutiny and uh, we have always maintained here in india that our space program is exclusively for development of our socio economic indicators we want our indians to benefit from space based activities directly so we haven't uh, gone to the indirect ways of retrieving benefits any space exploration activity will offer indirect benefits but these indirect benefits will come over long scales of time maybe 15 years from now 20 years 30 years from now we do not or we have not had a resources so much so that uh, we would wait for that long so we want quicker return on whatever investments that we are making so again that also shows that we are quite different from china we not been in race with them they have been ahead uh, but uh, you must also remember that they have been very ably they have been ably helped by the united states and europe uh, this entire western bloc has dumped their manufacturing responsibilities entirely on china and the west has been singularly responsible for making china what it is right now that's not the case with india um, china while it was manufacturing for the world it did not pay heed to human rights it did not pay heed to environmental protection but when we grow here after we'll have to or we will be quite cognizant about environmental protection our economic growth will be quite sustainable uh, we will have great emphasis on clean energy we'll have great emphasis on circular economy and all that and that's why you know uh, comparing india with china is like uh, comparing apples and oranges now you choose whether we are an apple or we are an orange so how can we handle like uh, india's space prowess to be used as a tool in india's foreign policy and diplomacy see our space prowess lies in the 
hands and minds of our youngster okay and i have been saying this for quite some time and eventually it led to some fruition when the indian government decided that it needs to open the space sector for the private companies and by private companies or private entities i mean not only startups but also big uh, conglomerates as well as uh, not for profit private entities so say for example tifr tifr is a not for profit entity prl uh, which is physical research laboratory it came up as a not for profit entity so many of the scientific institutions in india are not for profit entities eventually funded by the government uh so when i say youth why do i say that because look isro which has been the sole space agency for india for quite some time has certain limitations it, the first and foremost limitation is it cannot recruit beyond a certain threshold and what and shouldn't the country benefit from people who haven't been recruited by isro the country should benefit and that's why you need to create opportunities for youngsters who have the knack of working on not only on space technology or sciences but also on all the downstream applications that i've just spoken about so somebody from the banking sector who is interested in using satellite application for bank- banking purposes or financial or insurance purposes you need to give that person an opportunity and that opportunity will only come when uh, when the government opens the the close gates and the close gates were opened in 2020 during the first wave of the pandemic and after that you've seen that uh, we've had today we have at as many as 110 or 120 space startups exclusively space startups some of them are in mumbai some many in bangalore in hyderabad in gurugram all over the country so the future lies in the hands of youngsters uh, what bright how brightly they think of space technology how innovative are they with space applications and uh, how do they bring about economic growth not only for their country but also for the societies with which in which they live and for their families so our economy is very much intimately linked with uh, the progress of our youngsters and not the technology right so so this brings us to the next question that the us has engaged with india in small projects like nisar but no major projects uh with india like the next big us program are artemis and the lunar or orbital gateway europe and japan are partners for this initiative but despite the isro's phenomenal work over the years not india what do you think the reason could be <coughs> behind this okay nisar which is the nasa isro synthetic aperture radar is a project uh, which is used to or which will be eventually used to monitor the cryosphere and by cryosphere i mean the ice packs which are the glaciers the mountainous glaciers as well as the polar glaciers so what the countries uh, thought that let's uh, join hands in building a satellite that can map these uh, these sort of bodies because we are facing uh, several diminishing glaciers in asia in the himalayan karakoram belt in the atlas mountains there are quite a few diminishing glaciers we have diminishing glaciers in the alps in the rocky mountains in the andes mountains everywhere everywhere in the world in africa in the kilimanjaro mount kenya belt and uh, these glaciers especially the mountain packs they are the biggest fresh water reserves on the planet of the world so you need to map them you need to have good scientific data uh, collected about their health and well being and for that india and us have come together and when i say india and us have come together what i mean is actually scientists from india and us who have been studying cryosphere for quite some time using synthetic aperture radar they've joined hands it's not the governments but the first the first project was conceived by the scientists then it were taken to the respective governments and then they joined hands so this is how any science or space diplomacy happens it starts on the academic level and then it migrates or graduates to the government level when you talk about artemis awards 
with artemis of course the we do not have any issues i mean it's actually a good thing for the americans because look any country who wants to set up bases on the moon or mars will be full hardy if it goes and if it does everything on its own it's not a diy as we see it on social media it's not do it yourself it is always do it together and what the americans have done is they have identified international partners with whom it is comfortable uh, with whom it shares world view geopolitical views economic views uh, their strategic interests and america's strategic interests are tightly locked with each other and uh, these are the best partners that america could get for itself but when you look at the names of the countries which are part of artemis accords these are uh, these can be seen in a way as america's junior partners junior partners who are ready to contribute to the fund monetarily who are ready to give their people to support artemis accords and who are ready to share their technology with the united states to go to the moon or mars together there are countries who are not comfortable doing that like for instance china so what china has done is china has partnered with the russians and they have an equivalent of artemis accords which they are calling as china russia international lunar research station so the idea is to set up a base on the moon just like the american and their partners have a space station revolving in the lunar orbit and uh, have a logistics supply from here to the moon have a telecom connectivity between earth and moon and make sure that there are people and logistics moving across uh, continually this is the fate of the humanity that's for sure but is humanity's fate uh, again tidally interlocked with uh, geopolitical aspirations of a certain group no so that's why uh, and india has always believed in something known as strategic autonomy we want to maintain autonomy in sectors that we find are very crucial for our existence or the existence of modern indian state and we've always felt that space technology is something very crucial for us we are ready to partner with countries on case to case basis but we are not ready to partner with countries uh just for the heck of it just for uh you know making a statement and that's why uh americans have been very kind of to not invite us and put it, put us in a spot and we haven't shown any readiness to join the artemis accords and the question of china inviting to join us international lunar research station doesn't come at all so it is the strategic autonomy which will play out and eventually there are countries even within the artemis accords who wouldn't want to be seen as america's bum chumps so for instance more recently uae which is part of artemis accords which is a signatory to artemis accords it has also decided to partner with china on certain space missions so if anybody is under the impression that uh, if you belong to artemis you can't work with china and if you belong to international lunar research station you can't work with the us or nato uh, we are or these people are making fools of themselves it's not going to happen people are countries are going to mingle with countries across the blocks and india has been a master of working across the blocks for several decades now since we talked about isro so isro signing of memoranda of understanding with indian private rocket startups gives the countries private industry to perform space various activities what do you think this means for india's future in the space sector so india's future as i said in the space sector is um, lying on the plinth of uh, public private partnerships the government will be in charge of something which is known as high risk high reward projects where there is enormous amounts of financial risk technical risk but the government has the appetite to bear those risks so government will go ahead with those kind of projects 
and some uh, some projects and these kind of projects are usually not of commercial nature they may eventually give out commercial returns but not immediately the private sector is often risk averse it does not want to jeopardize its financial statements and bank sheets and for that private sector would be in charge of uh, many of space applications which have immediate uh, you know commercial value so as i said imaging is one humongous commercial value uh, satcom satellite communication is another humongous value if the government is wanting to go to the moon regularly every year or every quarter or every semester then the uh, private sector would find some value in building spacecrafts for the government to take them to the moon so eventually that will also happen commercial space stations uh, luckily for us we do not have to reinvent the wheel again and what will ha- eventually happen is so isro for now has the aim of setting up a low earth orbit station sometime in the next decade but what i feel is isro wouldn't keep it as a purely scientific space station because it does not give it returns immediately what isro would do is it will partner with the private sector uh, and the agencies that have been created for supporting the private sector these agencies are called as new space india limited and indian national space promotion and authorization center in space so these two agencies they will uh, help the private sector go to the space station have a manufacturing rack uh research on let's say pharmaceutical products which are of immense value immediate value materials are of uh, great use semiconductors of great use all these materials or technologies will be tested in microgravity in these space stations and companies will pay rent to use that real estate on the space station for a certain period of time so we will offer rentals to companies to operate there so these kind of business opportunities will come up and eventually it is public private enterprise you know uh, it is not government's destiny to be in space it is india's destiny to be in space and if it is india's destiny then uh, we are almost 1 uh, and 1/2 billion of us so the amount of human resource the quantum of human resource that is present in the country is humongous it needs to be tapped Thank you, sir, and it was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. And thank you for taking out time and coming on speaking territory. And anything you would like to add or say? I think you guys are doing a fantastic job uh, with speaking territory. I've just heard that uh, you've completed uh, more than ten episodes. Yeah. Yeah. Ten eleven. Ten eleven. Yeah. This is a fantastic. We need such sort of content creation from uh, our universities, uh, departments like yours. because uh, the content that you generate is consumed by uh, many like you in and uh, around india as well as across the world and this content is not only entertaining but infotaining you are providing information you are disseminating knowledge and uh, this is the greatest form of entertainment possible you know one that enlightens you so many congratulations to you all and uh, i hope you great success i'm sure this would be an insightful session for our listeners too thank you thank, thank you so you. much thank you.